Good afternoon, and welcome to the Johns Hopkins 30-minute COVID-19 briefing, where we provide live insights from the experts who lead our work at the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. For the next half hour, we'll focus on what you need to know right now about the COVID-19 pandemic and public health responses. This is our last briefing for 2021, but we will continue to offer these 30 minute briefings regularly on Fridays at 12 p.m. in 2022. I'm Dr. Lainey Rutko, a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I'm part of the leadership team for the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center. We'll be providing answers in real time today, so please submit your questions in the box that you see at the bottom of your screen. Today, I'm joined by two guests, First, we'll hear from Beth Blauer, who is Associate Vice Provost for Public Sector Innovation at Johns Hopkins, and she's the data lead for the Coronavirus Resource Center. Beth is going to talk about trends that we've seen over the last year, especially including in demographic data. Then we'll hear from Dr. Bill Moss, who's Executive Director of the Johns Hopkins International Vaccine Access Center and a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Bill will give us an update about COVID-19 vaccines. I'm now going to turn to each of our speakers for a brief overview. Beth, first to you. As you reflect back on this past year, since this is our last briefing for 2021, what do you see as the key developments relative to COVID-19 data? Thanks, Lainey, and, and thanks, and, and happy end of year. Um, looking forward to joining you again in the new year. Um, but it is pretty um, surreal to think that we now have um, pretty comprehensive sets of annual data measures that we can look at and do some of that comparative analysis. So today I'm going to take you through some slides um, and really show you what it looks like um, uh, uh, based on where we were this time last year, where we are this time this year, and some of the things that we should be looking for um, in the data moving forward. Um, but overall, you know, the, the, the global situation is we are still in a pandemic. Uh, disease is still spreading throughout communities around the globe. Um, and we are still very much um, collecting and really understanding the, um, um, the disease in ways um, that's really powered by uh, pandemic data. Um, just to give you a little bit more of a granular global perspective, though, um, we are looking at year over year data here. So you can see the steep increase in cases at the beginning part of the pandemic in, uh, in 2020. Um, and then you can see the kind of um, variability in that data. Um, but one thing I want to really make sure that we are emphasizing is the efficacy of vaccines. What we're seeing here is pretty significant case growth. Um, but what we didn't see, uh, because we were able to vaccinate uh, people around the globe, we aren't seeing the same level of mortality related uh, to COVID. And I think that that is really a direct response to having more immune protection that's provided by vaccination. Um, so we have seen almost a 50% decrease um, in the mortality of the disease, um, really because of the fact that, um, that um, the efficacy that we've seen uh, provided by those interventions. Um, they remain highly safe and effective, including against Delta and what we're now learning from um, data, early returns on Omicron uh, variants. But still in this country, only 62% of the population is fully vaccinated. Um, we see um, slightly better performance in the UK and Canada. Um, um, and then um, in China, we see around 83% coverage. And so, um, you know, one of the one of the paths um, to the to the other side of this is really uh, making sure that people feel confident in their decision making and, and making sure that we get more uh, folks um, taking advantage of vaccination when available. Um, we started offering widespread booster doses. It would be um, uh, uh, a mistake not to also signal that there are still regions in the, around the globe um, that are having significant challenges just getting basic vaccine supply. Uh, and so while many of you have had the opportunity to access uh, vaccines, that's not the case globally. Um, the frequency of COVID-19 case reporting is also stalling, continues to stall even in the midst of this new surge. 
Um, so as of today, we still have 37 states and territories that are not releasing daily data. And that continues to be restricted, um, not just um, uh, by decision making, but also um, like we saw here in Maryland, um, with some of the real strategy uh, with some of the real impairments um, from the technology side. We even have fewer states regularly report data disaggregated by demographics. So demographic data has always been a challenge. Um, it is so critically just to remind everyone why we care about demographic data. It's because it allows us to create really start strategic and targeted uh, interventions that are responsive to the specific needs of communities. In the United States, we really are still um, uh, flying blind when it comes to who has access to kind of the key uh, public health assets that are going to help um, bring more protection into communities. Uh, particularly testing and vaccination. Um, the, the Southwest of the United States, it's very evident um, that we don't know really um, who is getting access to vaccines and, 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 and testing has always uh, per, um, uh, persisted as a place where we haven't received very limited information on who has access to testing. Um, we, as part of the CRC, um, uh, last month, were able to launch our Disparity Explorer, where you can, with the limited information we have in demographic data, do some of that exploration and see where we have populations that are most hardest hit um, by COVID and, you know, really kind of docking or, or anchoring into some of the big public health challenges um, across the board around health disparity, but also around data, really highlighting here um, that even with limited data, we can see that there are pretty significant gaps in the way that people are accessing public health. Um, a little bit of that before and after, but if we're looking at um, where we were this week um, in 2020 versus where we are this week in 2021, we're seeing um, uh, still a we are not quite at the level where we were. Um, this is probably subject to change given some of the um, new activity that we're seeing around the Omicron variant, but we are um, still in, 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 a, in a stable state as it relates to new cases. Um, but again, it's something that we're gonna be tracking very closely. Um, as you can see, the United Kingdom, who we've always lagged a little bit behind, um, is actually seeing a pretty significant increase to where they were last year this time and where they are now. And we um, expect that that will probably replicate here, especially given the fact that we are less protected by vaccination coverage. Um, in South Africa, again, very concerning um, data showing uh, the impact of case spread, um, and they are experiencing a significant increase year over year. Um, we are also looking at testing positivity. Many states are seeing an uh, increase um, above that sort of 5% threshold uh, where the WHO and other health organizations want to see um, uh, us get to. Um, te that test positivity is also um, an indication of test availability and not testing in general. Um, but we are seeing a number of states here in this country above that threshold. Um, and we are continuing to also see limited availability of data. So you see many states are no longer reporting data in a way that we could get this information. So this is really going to hamstring our ability to monitor um, what's happening here in this country, uh, particularly around this holiday break, where we know that people are going to be spending time um, uh, traveling and, and with their friends and family. So still very much in um, the midst of a pandemic, the data is still our most important resource as we try to understand uh, what are the best interventions, what are the best strategies, and how we can get more people to adopt the best practices as it relates to public health. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Lainey and Bill. And before I turn to Bill, I do want to remind our audience, please submit questions for our experts in the box that you see at the bottom of your screen. I do see your questions coming in and we will turn to them shortly. Bill, since we were last together, we've learned a bit more about the Omicron variant and vaccines. I was hoping that you could begin by telling us what we know so far, but also all that we still need to understand. Yes, it's a it's a really important question, Lainey, and we are still learning and still have a lot to learn. I'll just note as we look back over the past year, it was one year ago uh, this past Tuesday, December 14th, that the first person in the United States to be vaccinated outside of a clinical trial, Sandra Lindsay, a nurse 
a critical care nurse at Long Island Jewish Medical Center was vaccinated. And so in that year, uh, we have uh, more than 200 million people in the United States who are fully vaccinated. So that is a remarkable achievement, but it still is only about two thirds of those eligible, those older than five years of age. Um, and so there is a third of the population that has not been uh, fully vaccinated, and they're part, uh, in large part responsible for uh, uh, continued transmission, but certainly for uh, hospitalizations. So I see, Lainey, three big questions uh, in the vaccine world. Um, will vaccines protect against Omicron? And that's what I'll focus on relating to your questions. But also, can we vaccinate the unvaccinated in the United States? And how do we vaccinate the world? Um, as we think about, you know, vaccine effectiveness against the Omicron variant, there are two broad ways uh, or in which we measure this or two lines of evidence. Um, and I will emphasize again, we're still learning and a lot more needs to be learned. Um, and that Delta remains uh, right for now, the, the major problem in the United States, although we expect Omicron to catch up in the coming days and weeks. Um, the two broad lines of evidence come uh, from laboratory data and from observational data in human populations. What we know uh, from the laboratory data, are, uh, and these are studies where uh, we look for the ability of uh, sera or plasma antibodies from individuals who've been vaccinated or have had prior infection, They're, the ability of their antibodies to neutralize uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a laboratory, in a test tube, basically. Um, and so we're looking for what we call neutralizing antibodies. Most laboratories don't use SARS-CoV-2 itself. They use what's called the pseudovirus, which is a lot safer, but it expresses the spike protein or has the spike protein on it. And what we know with Omicron is that it takes much higher levels of antibodies from both those who've been with prior infection and those who've been vaccinated to neutralize the Omicron variant. To say that in another way, for a given level of neutralizing antibodies, the effectiveness, the ability of, of those antibodies to neutralize the Omicron variant is much, much, much less. Um, and what's happening here is that, you know, the genetic changes in the spike protein and particularly the receptor binding domain our, our antibodies just don't bind as well to that, uh, to that part of the protein because of the genetic changes in that protein. And so they'll bind, but they'll fall off. They'll bind and fall off. And we call this avidity, antibody avidity. Um, and uh, higher avidity means that those antibodies bind tighter and tighter uh, to the proteins. But what we've learned too is that that kind of poor binding, looser binding between the antibody and the spike protein can be overcome just by increasing the amount uh, of antibodies present. So what you could imagine kind of what's happening me mechanistically is, you know, the, the, the poor binding antibodies are binding and falling off, but if you have a lot of them, they can, they'll, they'll, uh, uh, they'll replace one another and kind of stick to that uh, protein and be able to block uh, the, the spike protein from allow, from binding to our cells and allowing the virus to enter our cells. So what we've learned from the laboratory studies are higher levels of neutralizing antibodies are required uh, to prevent uh, the Omicron variant from getting into our cells. Now, there are a lot of uh, uh, caveats around this. Um, uh, these, uh, the antibody levels, the very high antibody levels we get after booster doses, for example, um, are, are transient. Maybe they last weeks, months, um, but they are, our antibody levels don't stay permanently very high. People with weaker immune systems are going to be less likely to develop these higher levels of neutralizing antibodies. So those individuals may remain quite vulnerable. And importantly, antibodies aren't our only defense. Um, we do have cellular immune responses, particularly our memory uh, T cell and B cell responses. 
And these really help up protect us against severe disease. So the reason why a vaccine might be, you know, effective against infection, uh, I'm sorry, not uh, less effective against infection, but still protect us against um, uh, severe disease is because of these memory immune responses and these cellular immune responses. And there have been some data recently looking at the T cell responses in the laboratory to Omicron variant, and those look to be quite good. Again, very preliminary data. Now, we, that's the laboratory side. We, don't, we do not have clinical trial data, um, but we do have ob observational studies uh, in different populations. And what are we learning? I'm gonna try to break this down very simply, uh, recognizing that there's a lot of variation here, a lot still to be known. But I think what we're seeing is that vaccine effectiveness against uh, infection is markedly lower against the Omicron variant than against prior variants. Just to put some numbers on that, again, very rough, maybe vaccine effectiveness against infection, 70 to 80% against prior uh, uh, variants, down to 30% uh, with Omicron. That means that there are gonna be more susceptible people uh, in a population, even those who are vaccinated or had some prior infection, that allows the virus to transmit more because they're just more susceptible. So we are gonna see more cases uh, here in the United States and elsewhere because of this, and, and we already are. Now, how about vaccine effectiveness against severe disease? This is really the important uh, question. And what I'm talking about is, uh, will the vaccines protect against hospitalizations and death? I think here too, we're going to see some decrease in vac vaccine effectiveness, but against severe disease, but not as much as we see with vaccine effectiveness against infection. So here, maybe we're talking about, you know, 80 to 90% protection against severe disease with prior variants, maybe down down to about 70%. Um, but we also need to learn, is, is the Omicron variant less virulent itself? Does it cause less severe disease? Um, and that's, that's kind of one of the big remaining questions that we'll learn more about in the coming uh, days and weeks. Now, booster doses, as I said before, they're going to increase these neutralizing antibodies. So they may, at least for some period, increase that, that vaccine effectiveness against infection down from that kind of low of 30%, maybe back up to about 70%. But a lot of caveats here, Lainey. We need more data. Um, vaccine effectiveness is going to vary across individuals and populations depending upon their age, the vaccine type, underlying medical conditions, time since vaccination, prior exposure to SARS-CoV-2. All of this, all of these kind of complicating factors make it quite difficult um, to really get a handle on this and to compare across populations. Um, uh, and, and I just want to highlight, too, that booster doses, I think, are going to provide at least some transient protection on the order of weeks to months because of that big uh, increase in, in, in neutralizing antibody levels. Um, but we may need a more frequent booster doses or, ideally, an, an Omicron-specific booster. But I will, I, I'll just end by saying, Lainey, boosters are going are gonna to be helpful, but they're not going to be, they're not going to get us out of the, out of the, the surge that we're going to see in the coming weeks and months with Delta, perhaps overtaken by Omicron. And we need to be practicing the other public health measures to really avoid what I think is the big tragedy is if we see our healthcare systems and hospitals and intensive care units overwhelmed and are already exhausted and burdened healthcare workers just strained even more. Thanks so much, Bill. Something tells me we'll be talking about these topics too together. Before I move to the questions, I want to remind our viewers that we do have a weekly newsletter from the Johns Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center that you can subscribe to. You'll see a banner on your screen that you can click on to subscribe. It's called The Week in COVID-19, and it is a great way to get the latest news and analyses from our experts about the virus itself, variants, vaccines, and critical trends. And now I'm going to turn to the questions that have been coming in, um, lots of them today. Bill, I'm going to turn to you first. Question about CDC's recent announcement recommending the mRNA vaccines, meaning Pfizer and Moderna, over J&J. &J. And how do you see that impacting 
acceptance or potentially access to vaccines, both within and outside of the United States? Yes, this is a, it's a really important question. And so, you know, we are very fortunate in that we have multiple different vaccines to choose from. Uh, we're not always in that type of situation. Um, and so, as, as many people know, many of our listeners know, what happened yesterday is the CDC expressed a preference uh, for the two mRNA vaccines here in the United States, Pfizer and Moderna, over the J&J because of accumulating data on a rare uh, but serious adverse event uh, associated with the J&J &J vaccine, and those are the blood clots. About 54 uh, cases have been reported, nine deaths. And so because of that, um, the CDC uh, stated this preference for the mRNA vaccines. Now, uh, about uh, less than 2% uh, of people vaccinated in the United States have received the J&J &J vaccine. Um, so I don't see it impacting, uh, you, you know, in, in important ways, uh, our ability to vaccinate uh, people here in the United States. Um, there will be concerns uh, about the AstraZeneca vaccine as well, which is also an adenovirus vectored vaccine that has been associated with blood clots that has been used uh, widely throughout the world. It's not uh, authorized for use in the United States. So I don't see it have a, a big, the short answer is I don't see it have a big impact here in the United States. Um, I, I, and what I would like to the messaging to be is that this is our vaccine safety system system at work. Um, this is how we want our vaccine safety system to, uh, to be able to identify these, ad these rare adverse events and, and to take uh, public health steps um, should the concern raise be raised over time. Um, this is not a failure of our system. Uh, this is actually a success uh, of the very rigorous uh, vaccine safety uh, monitoring and evaluation we have in the United States. Now, in some people, uh, they may say, look, I told you so, you know, these vaccines are safe. But I think this is, this is really uh, our safety system at work. Um, and the CDC says the benefits still outweigh the risks, even for the J&J &J vaccine. Thanks very much, Bill. Beth, question for you, and this is a topic that uh, you and I have spent a whole lot of the last week or so talking about. The Maryland, um, Maryland has not been in a position to release daily case data um, to the public or for local health departments for about two weeks. Can you speak to what you see as the, the real world, the practical impact of not having access to, um, to data for that period? Yeah, for those of for those of our viewers that are not here in Maryland and maybe not be keeping up with this one, um, the Maryland Department of Health was hacked by an external, uh, you know, source. We have no very limited information about what happened. Very dangerous hack um, because they it really sort of cut them off from the capacity to pull this data in. Um, and the real danger in the fact that you don't have that access means that um, the Maryland Department of Health has done a tremendous job uh, aggregating data and sharing it with all the local jurisdictions in the state. And when the hack occurred, they essentially were cut off from being able to do that. And so what was happening is that they lost the connectivity to all of those inputs and they lost the ability to be able to support um, all of the local jurisdictions and the way that they have been doing so across the entire um, pandemic arc. And so that means that counties and cities across the state of Maryland didn't have that very critical information about the case activity and about deaths that were occurring related to COVID uh, within their jurisdictions. And it created a very dangerous situation from a public policy perspective as we're heading into the holidays, not really knowing what that case activity is. It really hamstrings both public policy and then individuals that are driving decision-making like, am I going to that holiday party? Am I going to be inside? Where am I going to wear a mask? All of these decisions are really driven by a fundamental understanding of what's happening. And these hackers took the ability for us to use data to drive that decision making away from us. So I'm, my thoughts are with the Maryland Department of Health, as I know they are working diligently and very hard to bring that data back online. And I'm hoping that um, they're navigating out of this soon. Thanks very much, Beth. Bill, question for you, for someone who is vaccinated, how much of a threat do they pose in terms of transmitting the virus if they're compared to someone who is wholly unvaccinated? 
Yes. So I think it, it's important to know that people who are vaccinated can get infected. Um, we do see, break, obviously, breakthrough infections, even breakthrough disease, rarely, though that, uh, that's really in people whose immune systems are compromised. But um, and, and individuals who are vaccinated, when they get infected, can initially have high viral loads uh, in their upper airway and so can transmit. The, the data suggests that, however, that that period of infectiousness, the duration in which vaccinated individuals are actually infectious is much shorter than in an unvaccinated individual. Um, and that diminishes the, uh, reduces the likelihood that uh, an infected vaccinated person is going to transmit to another, another individual. So I'd say the bottom line is vaccinated people can get infected. That's going to probably be more common with the Omicron variant, but that duration of infectiousness, and that has to do with that memory immune response kind of kicking in and clearing the virus, that infectious period is shorter. So the period of transmissibility, uh, is is reduced. Thanks, Bill. Here's another one that I know is close to your heart. Advice for folks as we head into the holidays for speaking with family and friends who are vaccine hesitant. Yes, um, you know, it's obviously a, a, a complex issue. We could probably talk the whole half hour about this, but I'll say the bottom line is to, is to listen, um, show empathy, try to understand their position, um, but also, um, you know, correct misinformation um, and try to present uh, the, the positives, the pros uh, uh, of vaccination. And what I try to do is, is to say, is, is to make people understand, because I think this is really important, that it's not just about you as an individual, um, it's really our collective response uh, and our collective responsibility as a society, as a community to get vaccinated. What I really see as tragic is the overwhelming of our healthcare system, uh, our hospitals, our ICUs, as I said before, our exhausted uh, healthcare workers. Um, and that's a responsibility we need to take as a society, as a community. Um, so it's not just an individual decision. It's for the good of the uh, of the whole. Thanks, Bill. Well, I think that's a perfect note to end our 2021 briefings on. I'd like to thank Beth Blauer and Bill Moss for joining me today and give a big thank you to everyone who has joined us and especially those who submitted questions for our experts to answer. As always, this briefing will be archived and available on coronavirus.jhu.edu. As a reminder, this is our last briefing for 2021, but we will continue to offer these 30-minute briefings on Fridays in 2022. We'll all look forward to seeing you next year. Until then, thanks and stay safe.